Welcome inside with the insiders. It is Tom Pellicero alongside Judy Batista and Ian Rappaport, fourth member of our team, Mike Garofolo, joins us shortly, but we're out. We're out of the it's home sprung. studios here. We're <laughs> at the better. NFL December meeting here in Irving, Texas. The front office accelerator is going on right now where some of the young minority and women executives around the league getting to interface with owners, going through a variety of different meetings. We'll speak with some of them over the next couple of days here. We also do have, Judy, some perhaps news items and announcements that could potentially come over these next couple of days. Yeah, we could get news on international games, including the possibility of having a lot more international games. I'm certainly looking forward to that, especially someone who's still hoping for the chance to go. We also have Super Bowls all set up through Super Bowl 60. We do not have a 61 at some point. You would think that announcement and decision is coming, so certainly that is something to look forward to potentially tomorrow as well. Tom. We'll get to injury updates around the league as well, the latest on Justin Herbert, Justin Jefferson, among others. But right now, let's bring in Garofolo because, Mike, we had football last night in Good Miami football. Gardens. Two games, and I had people asking me, why are they having two simultaneous Monday games? I don't know, because it's Good awesome, question. and it was awesome to flip back and forth That's between awesome. two games that went down to the wire, including the Dolphins and the Titans in Miami in a game that a lot of folks did not think was going to be competitive and that maybe the Dolphins would reclaim the one seed in the AFC. It looked like maybe that was going to be the case. They were up 7 nothing, but then this happened right here. A hip drop tackle. We're going to get to that in a second. Sean Murphy bunting, the one that's grabbing his hip, but Tyreek Hill grabbing his ankle afterward said he thought his ankle was gone right here, but then as all the fans and everyone were silent at Hard Rock Stadium, adrenaline kicked in and he ran off the field. However, he would still miss about half of this game as he then started to feel it after that would return later on. So let's go to the fourth quarter after Hill had finally come back in the game. So he just ran in by himself. Here's Eric Garr uh, for the Titans trying to field this one. This in-between hop. Recovered by Elijah Campbell. That's Tom Quinn who just became the full-time uh, Titans special teams coach. Somehow didn't mess up his hair as he threw his headset. Dolphins would take the lead, 20-13. to 13. And then this one, Will Levis to Derrick Henry. Bradley Chubb recovers. Raheem Mostert then takes it in. Congratulations to Andy Slater. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go look up his Twitter account. He let it ride on Raheem Mostert, and it paid off. Second touchdown of the day for Mostert. The Dolphins would go on to win. 20, I'm sorry, what? There's more? Okay, well, okay. This one made it at least more respectable, and maybe some folks were... Happy to see the Titans score here and cut it to a one-score game. Mike Vrabel going for two. This is something that analytics have said. They make the two, so now they're down six. Wait, hold on. They actually had a shot to come. Is this really going to happen? Yeah. DeAndre Hopkins, 36 yards, gets away from Jalen Ramsey there. Four plays later, just under two minutes to go. Derrick Henry in for the three-yard touchdown. Now because of that two-point conversion, only needed the extra point. The Dolphins would get it back. Would not score. Will Levis, veins are popping. Titans with the upset. Our Cam Wolf with DeAndre Hopkins afterward. All the talk coming into this game was about the Dolphins. What did you guys show in that fourth quarter coming back and taking this victory? We showed resiliency. Uh, showed that we wanted to win. No matter what our records say, we're going to compete. We're going to go out there and play hard. And uh, You've seen that today. Your quarterback, Will Levis, is a rookie. But what did you see in him? and especially in that fourth quarter as he's leading you guys for the comeback. I saw a dog. I saw a dog out here today. That, that kid is going to be great, man. I'm always in his ear trying to help him, uh, you know, read defenses and, and be better. Uh, I know he still got a lot in his tank. I know he can improve even though, you know, he came out here and beat, beat these guys today. But I'm going to still be on the Monday when we go back and uh, let him know that there are certain things that he can improve on. But, man, we'll show heart. Uh, man, I, I love I love competing and playing with them. This is a big confidence booster for us, for sure. I mean, this is not the you know record we would hope to have at this point in the season. Um, not the position we'd hope to be in um, in the playoff race and all that. But all we can do is just keep pushing. And we talked about that all week. And we had opportunity to come and, and spoil their party, and um, you know, be a really good football team and build confidence going forward. And, and I'm so glad we were able to do that. Um, yeah. I'm excited to watch that HBO episode. We all get to share the share the blame, in, in, in my opinion, or at least know the locker room felt um, 100% responsible. I think that's what you want. I think um, there's a lot of people that are going to be uh, it's going to be tough to go to sleep tonight, including myself. So. 
especially because he wakes up at like 2.30 in the morning every single day to get into the office. But uh, the Dolphins did not take advantage of the chance to get into that one seed. So now you see this AFC is still jam-packed from one all the way through the teams that are really in the hunt here. Not much separating them. It's going to be a wild, wild finish in the AFC. Just like this game last night was a wild finish. Cameron Wolf, as we just saw, was there for us, as was Brian Baldinger calling the game for Westwood One. Baldy still in South Florida. Got himself a late checkout today, still in the hotel room right there. He must have elite status. I love it. Baldy, uh, let's talk about the Titans because, you know, Titans fans love to tell us how we don't talk about the Titans. So let's start there. Let's start with Will Levis, uh, whose philosophy last night was see open receiver, throw to open receiver. Boy, he did a great job. You know, first of all, you've done a great job here. Uh, conducting this uh, this whole, the, the, everything from the, the highlights, Mike, because honestly, when it was 27 and 13, I thought we were switching to the game in New York and we were going to be heard. And I'm like, hang on, hang on. Because I met Will Levis down the field before the game. You like to meet the new guys in this league, introduce yourself. I mean, he's a block of granite now. But I mean, all he does, I mean, I'm just showing a couple of the throws right here. This is right before the end of the first half. He let this ball fly right here. He gets hit for Bradley Chubb. From behind right here he he stood tall in the pocket he does have a cannon he told the world the combine he's got a cannon he let it fly uh cam great interview with uh deandre hopkins right there at the end of the game uh, they couldn't get him down to the ground i mean it was just one big throw after all. that led to a field goal uh in the final seconds before the end of the first half but you watch these throws right here and this one to tajay spears i mean this is against tough coverage against uh Xavier howard right there dropped it in perfectly you know, one big throw after another. That was a catch, ruled a catch right there. You know, this one right here where you find DeAndre Hopkins in the end zone, you got to be able to move with the pocket right here. It's not right there. It's collapsing. But stay alive and keep your eyes up and then find Hopkins right here for this touchdown as he pops open here. I mean, I just thought the movement, the arm, the poise, all that under the lights of being at Hard Rock Stadium in South Florida, you – he said it was a confidence builder, and you could feel the whole team kind of build and grow off of that confidence last night. Yeah, Baldy, this gives you something as Titans fans to look forward to. Like, the reality is this has been a rebuilding season for the Titans, but to find a quarterback like Will Levis, like, there were plays in the first half where he was lowering his shoulder and running people over. Like, you have the toughness of a quarterback, the clutch of a quarterback who does not blink down 14 with less than three minutes left. That's what you want in your franchise guy. And I was talking to people on the sidelines in pregame, and they were telling me the recipe to win. It's like, we just need to get it to the fourth quarter, make it grimy, make it ugly. And we think that Will will make some plays. And Charles London has been working with his quarterback coach, and he says he absolutely has everything that takes to be our franchise quarterback. Look at some of these throws he threw to DeAndre Hopkins down the field. That's against Xavier Howard, against Jalen Ramsey, two of the better corners in the league. That's what you want to see from your quarterback. And this win was really a Mike Vrabel special. 14-point underdog. Everybody's talking about the offseason for the Titans. The Dolphins are talking about the number one seed. And they came in, and they were the more physical team, more dominant defensively. And it was really a statement for everyone. And one thing in that DeAndre Hopkins interview that we didn't play, Hopkins felt like this was a statement for him. He called out all the teams that called, said he was washed, that he didn't have any more gas. And it almost felt like he was speaking in the camera to, like, the Chiefs or other teams and saying, what do you think now? What do you think now? And I think a lot of people in the Titans are saying, hey, we have something to prove over these last four games going into 2024. Yeah, listen, uh, just because you may be out of the playoffs doesn't mean you stop playing uh, hard-nosed football, and the Titans are certainly doing that or did it last night. Uh, at the very least, Cam, let's flip it to Tyreek Hill. Uh, I thought this was fascinating, the way that he said nobody told him to go back in the game. Nobody said, hey, Reek, yeah. go. I just ran in because I <laughs> felt like I needed to give this team a spark. He certainly was. That, that spark was gone. Now, uh, look, he obviously is a big part of what they do. Uh, we'll see if he's limited at all by this ankle injury going forward. they got to be able to kind of compensate if just one guy goes down. Mike McDaniel was saying that during the game, during the uh, uh, interview with Laura Rutledge at halftime. So uh, your thoughts on what impact Tyreek Hill going down had and what it could mean for the Dolphins going forward. Yeah, Mike, Baldy and I were just talking about this in the break. If you had any doubts about Tyreek Hill being a legitimate MVP candidate, this was your case. This Dolphins offense looked out of whack, out of sorts. Communication was off when Tyreek was out of this game. 
He was so important to their offense. You, I kept looking at the sideline of him just standing there next to teammates and waiting for him to come in and save the day. And it was halfway through the third quarter where he comes in and literally the whole crowd starts chanting MVP like he's their savior, right? And so it makes me wonder, why wasn't he able to come in earlier? Why didn't he play more games, more questions late? We'll get some answers from Mike McDaniel on that. But from what I understand, there's some level of a sprained ankle. He's playing on a short week. He played through pain. He joked that he texts his wife at halftime and said that his ankle hurt and he, she told him to get back into the game. And so uh, he decided to go back into this. But for the Dolphins, they've got a precarious stretch coming up. They've got the Jets. They've got the Cowboys. They've got the Ravens. They've got the Bills. This is one bad loss, but they can't let this boil over. And one more thing I want to tell you that kind of troubled me. I was in the locker room last night. Bradley Chubb said they were looking a little bit ahead. He said, when you have a goal in front of you, you're on cruise control. And we took our foot off the gas. Dolphins can't do that going forward. No, they can't, Cam. And, you know, they had a great opportunity last night, up 27-13. Nobody played well in the final minutes of that game. Defensively, way too many open receivers. Uh, there was communication breakdowns on defense. But when Tyreek isn't in on the field for that team right now, it right. looks like a different team. Tua doesn't look the same player. They don't get the explosive plays. Tua's holding the ball longer than he wants to. And Tennessee's rush got there and affected him. He went through that game last night, did not throw a touchdown pass for the first time in I don't know how many games, 20-something games right now. Um, the offense is clearly not nearly the same, and it doesn't scare the defense like it does as soon as Tyreek enters the field. The whole energy of the stadium changes when he's on the field versus, you know, having a towel around his neck on the sideline. Cam, Baldy, great stuff. Hang tight. We're coming back to both of you guys throughout the show. Baldy, tell housekeeping, uh, I don't know, like 20 more minutes <laughs> yeah. or so. Thanks. <laughs> They'll be fine. Uh, I mentioned the hip drop tackle. Here it is. It's kind of a combination here. It's like the hip drop plus the, the, the horse collar. It's almost a daily double there. They've outlawed the horse collar. Uh, they're now potentially the NFL, that is. I mean, they've talked about it. Outlawing the hip drop tackle. We've had some hip drop tackle injuries in primetime national games. Geno Smith got hurt early in the year uh, on one of those when they were playing the Giants. We bring back in our folks at the league meeting in Dallas because this will be part of the conversation. It's not like we're going to get a, a final vote on this, but it will be part of the conversation down there amongst many topics at the uh, winter league meeting in Dallas. So take it away down there. There's always a health and safety discussion at this December meeting. No voting items, but a lot of times this is a time for them to look at data and then we'll talk about maybe some of the potential rule changes that might get discussed down the line here as we get closer to that March meeting. Let's talk about the hip drop tackle. It's one of several that are on the agenda this week. The complication has been explained to me is just how do you write this rule? How do you explain it in such a way that officials are actually going to be able to call it and call it consistently? We can certainly look at plays like last night, we can look at plays like the one that broke Mark Andrews' ankle and say, okay, there's some clear ones, but there's other calls, too, that are more of a gray area. Where do we stand? Uh, I, I think we stand knowing that when you see it, you know exactly what it is. I mean, I think anyone watched Tyreek Hill go down last night, and that's the kind of hit that we should outlaw in the NFL. I think you watched the Mark Andrews play, the Geno Smith play, Judy, along the sideline. I don't know how you word it. I don't know how to define it. There are certainly people who do this. Uh, much more than I do who will be able to do that. But anyone can watch and see that this is a play that has no place in football. I do expect it to be banned. I also expect some discussion on the kickoffs. I know they limited the amount of kickoffs essentially you could return based on trying to limit concussions. That also will be addressed at these meetings. Yeah, the competition committee, which starts their meetings uh, in February at the Combine, spent a lot of time on hip drop tackles last year. And they couldn't get to a point where they could figure out how to write the rule. And the other concern was, could officials see it in real time? Will they be able to look at a tackle and know that's it, throw the flag? Certainly, since we have seen the high-profile injuries this year, there's no question they are going to go back. I don't have any doubt yeah. that they're going to ban it. This time, they've had a year to figure it out. I did talk to a head coach recently, too, who was in favor of banning the hip drop tackle. And what he said was, you should be able to officiate it because you have a second action. It's the grab, right. and, and then, then it's landing. the use of the leverage right. here. But again, right. the complicated part of this is just... How do you end up yeah. writing that rule? All right, we got some other news, including breaking news out of Los Angeles within the past few minutes. Chargers quarterback Justin Herbert undergoing season-ending, at least regular season-ending surgery for that fractured index finger on his throwing hand. Ian, we knew that it was likely yeah. going this direction over the past couple of days here. The Chargers still have faint playoff hopes 
alive, but you can anticipate here Herbert's going to end up on injured reserve, and it's going to be Easton Sticks starting on Thursday night. That's right. At least four games for Justin Herbert. I would expect some more, though. He is undergoing, actually, right now, uh, undergoing surgery to repair that finger. It's a right index finger. He is a thrower who keeps the index finger on the ball a long time. He is going to be out of I think there was really no question when a quarterback breaks a finger, he is not going to play again for some time. So now we know it is official. Easton Stick Thursday and going forward in a frustrating, frustrating season for the Los Angeles Chargers. Somehow it gets worse. It is Chargers Raiders on Thursday night, certainly. Again, when we show those playoff graphics, both teams just hanging in the picture yeah. at this point. The Steelers, Judy, despite a couple of Stunning rough it. losses over the past couple of weeks, you all of a sudden look up, they're still sitting there, and I believe it's the number six seed, but not going to have Kenny Pickett for at least another week. Nope, they won't. Uh, don't forget, he had ankle surgery still out. Uh, Mike Tomlin said, so it's Mitchell Trubisky going again, even though the fans in Pittsburgh were chanting for Mason Rudolph. They're not going to get their wish. It's Kenny Pickett going forward um, in an enormous game, as you said, for the AFC playoff picture against the Colts this week. Better news for the Vikings. Coach Kevin O'Connell said yesterday that there's a really good chance Justin Jefferson is going to be on the field Saturday against Cincinnati. Just six days after that hit, from Raider safety Marcus Epps sent him to the hospital. My understanding was the trip to the hospital was a precaution. They needed to rule out any internal injuries specifically to his lung. He passed every test. He was able to fly back with the team. Now, he's sore. He is bruised. That may take some time here, but obviously in the big picture, really good news for Justin Jefferson and the Vikings that he even potentially yeah. could be back without missing a game after all the time he's missed earlier on this season. All right, well, we'll talk more after this break about the other game last night, though certainly to Tommy DeVito, his family, his agent, this was the game of the night. Could he channel a little bit more magic? How are the Giants pulling off <laughs> A little bit of a rally here after their brutal yeah, start are. to the season. Yeah, they are. Our Brian Baldinger going to be back. Baldy's breakdowns on Giants Packers right after this on the Insiders.